Welcome everyone to the GBSN cross-border coffee break um, titled, What are the learning skills of the future and how can we teach them now? So before we get started and before I introduce our presenter for today, I just wanted to do a little bit of administration. Um, you are muted throughout the entire duration of this webinar, but we will do a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Um, so you can submit questions throughout the entire presentation through the Zoom Q&A feature. Um, so to submit a question, you just click the Q&A button at the bottom or top um, toolbar, wherever it's located on your screen. And this box will pop up. Um, you can submit your question anonymously. So by doing that, you click the send anonymously button and then you, you just click send. All the questions will be put in a queue in which um, we will get to at the end. Um, Professor Popova will also be, you know, prompting questions throughout the webinar. So when she prompts a question for you to answer, um, type in your answers in the chat function. So we'll be able to see. So I'm Nicole Zeffern, I'm the communications officer at the Global Business School Network and I facilitate the majority of the cross-border coffee break webinars. Today we have um, Professor Anguili Anguilina Popova um, she is an associate professor and the director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology at the American University of Central Asia. So now I will hand it over to Professor Popova uh, to begin your presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, so um, uh, I am very uh, excited to be here, but I also a little bit nervous because it's the first time I do a webinar where I have no idea who is listening to me. Uh, so I would like to first ask you if you could please in the chat box, uh, tell us which country you're in and what is your position at your institution. Uh, this would be very useful for me to know who am I talking to. Um, and while you do that, um, I am going to tell you a few words about the center that I lead. Uh, the center has been crea was created in 2013, a very slow start, um, and now we are um, an integrated part in uh, the structure of the university, uh, and we provide trainings to um, new faculty and not new faculty on the course design uh, and on using technology in education. And my background is in sociology, political science and educational technology. Um, all right, so we have people from the US. Hello, it's probably evening there for you. So um, uh, I'll try to keep you entertained. <laughs> Um, all right, um, so uh, I'm currently uh, involved in our uh, research on the future, future of skills uh, because uh, we're doing the strategic, next strategic planning of the university and I wanted to investigate what uh, educationalists from our part of the world think in terms of what skills do, we, do they think we need to teach uh, to our uh, students and also look into what skills the uh, employers expect. Um, we do have some ideas already because we have regular meetings with through our curriculum boards with stakeholders, uh, but I wanted to do a, a more of an in-depth research of that. And um, so, uh, of course, similar research has been done in the West, uh, including for my PhD supervisor, uh, so I wanted to see how do we compare. And in your network, you have universities from all over the world. And um, I think that to some extent we deal with similar problems and but maybe also with some different problems for economic reasons. Uh, so in uh, 2015 and 2016, the World Economic Forum uh, came up with what you see on the screen, a uh, list of the 21st century skills. And I would like you to please take a look into these skills and tell me what do you think, which of these would you qualify as 21st century skills? So um, the skills are broken into three categories, foundational literacy, such as literacy, numeracy, scientific literacy, ICT, com information computer technology, financial literacy, cultural and civic literacy, and then competences, 
which means how students approach complex challenges. And this is critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, communication skills, and collaborate, uh, collaboration skills. And then character qualities, such as curiosity, initiative, leadership. And I think that since you are uh, mainly in a business, um, a business administration or MBA teaching, this is probably uh, very important for you. And uh, social and cultural awareness. Could you please in the, um, in the chat box if you think that some of these skills are particularly relevant for um, the 21st century, if you could probably um, leave us a message in the chat box. Okay. Cultural and civic literacy. This is very uh, interesting. Okay, we are. Um, it's we have one of our core competences is uh, civic in, uh, responsibility, civic engagement, and I assume that you have a lot of corporate social responsibility integrated into your courses. Um, but when you think a bit uh, about it. Um, we have people have moved around the world uh, for for a very long time, uh, and I uh, I live in Bishkek, which is on the Silk Road, and the Silk Road has existed for centuries. So people have mixed uh, ethnically and culturally a lot, um, and maybe today we see uh, cultural and civic literacy with new eyes, and we have more advanced approach maybe, but in a way this is something that people have had. To deal with um, ever since they started migrating. Um, so let's see if this is going to respond. The, uh, oops, Nicole Meyer. Ah, okay, it's fine. It works. Sorry. <laughs> so some authors uh, argue that the the real twenty first century skills are um, actually related to technology uh, and more digital technology and information because we didn't have this before. Um, so for example, um, some like an argument would be that uh, the, uh, the first people in Mesopotamia when they uh, cultivated grains from grasses that led to uh, community formation, to trade, to creation of cities, to division of labor and so on. So these are critical thinking, problem solving, and uh, communication and collaboration, which in extent can, can also uh, be relevant to cultural literacy. But there was no digital technology and the information was scarce. While now we have an explosion of, uh, of information, everybody is producing something that is considered or can be qualified as information. So um, some authors argue that the real 21st century skills, these are information literacy that is searching, identifying, evaluating quality and reliability of online information uh, and effectively using it and also um, curating and sharing, sharing this information. So uh, I mentioned this because I would like to, us to think in perspective of, um, next slide. Hopefully it's going to work. Uh, hello, Angela. Uh, but I agree with Katie. I agree with you. These are skills that all our students need. It's just the question is whether they're 21st or not 21st, just to introduce the uh, um, the uh, technology. And um, so, what do you think? Would computers and artificial intelligence replace workers, or they would create new demand for labor? What is your perspective on that? Um, we talk a lot about how some work, uh, some jobs will uh, be, uh, will disappear in 15 years from now, 20 years from now, maybe even sooner, some parts of the world. Um, this can be from uh, people working in coffee shops where um, a robot can create, can make coffee for, for the customers to some more complex tasks, uh, including big data analysis, uh, accounting uh, and other financial operations. This is, um, uh, this is one of the uh, very likely possibility, but also some people argue that, well, there will be some jobs might disappear, but others will be uh, created. 
So um, if you can write in the chat box, what do you think? Do you worry about your about your job as uh, maybe educators, whether this would um, uh, affect your work? Do you think that in 50 years from now, we will be teaching, we'll be having the jobs we have now? Okay, while you are um, uh, inputting your, uh, your answers, I'll go on. Or well, maybe we can give it a little bit of time for you to, uh, to think. Okay. Um, okay, I'll give you some um, hints maybe. Um, with your uh, the platforms on MOOCs, massive online open courses, uh, or um, other platforms like Lunda, where people can have courses on um, specific that train them in specific programs or specific skills, um, and uh, maybe this can affect the the work of educators in, in the future. The, the possibility to have individualized learning paths uh, where uh, a lot of the material, or even something, something more simple, flipped classroom, where students can read ahead of time and we as uh, educators are not necessarily, we don't need to deliver lectures because there is so much knowledge that can be uh, shared with students ahead of time or and on demand. Okay, so uh, some authors argue that there is a depreciation or will be a depreciation of human capitals in terms of knowledge and skills and abilities and vision. Um, and this would reflect in the way that uh, professionals or workers uh, might not be able to update their knowledge fast enough. Okay, oh, uh, we have an answer. And, uh, and, uh, and they might not update their skills and their knowledge fast enough to be able to, to be flexible for, uh, for their current or their future jobs. Um, so I'm gonna read the answer from Jim Rice. Thank you, Jim. Um, so you say you're focused on executive education and artificial intelligence in, will be important, uh, but we will still need the human engagement and strategic thinking, especially within the cross-national, cross-discipline and cross-cultural game. Um, wonderful, exactly. So we'll go a little bit further in the presentation in um, what kind of activities we can do. I'm not quite sure whether we'll have enough time, so I just prepared three options. Um, okay, so the, your thank you, Jim, you kind of give answer to the question and then what should we as educators do so that our students' uh, um, jobs are not obsolete in, uh, well, their jobs might be obsolete, but their skills shouldn't be obsolete. And, uh, 10 or 15 years from now. Um, I am myself from uh, Europe and we use there this term lifelong learning. Maybe, maybe the terminology varies from one place to another, but I think we can all understand lifelong learning as the ability to learn throughout your life that is being flexible. Um, okay, so now I would like to uh, tell you more about uh, one of the uh, interesting researches that was done um, last year with um, educational experts in Europe and North America. And, um, and the way they see what kind of skills should we um, focus on uh, uh, when we construct our classes and our curriculum. And uh, so one of the terms that the researchers came up with is future-proof learning. Um, future-proof learning is basically learning that does not, um, I'll read you the, the definition, uh, is defined by the acquisition of knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary to continue to learn in a stable and enduring way in a rapidly changing world. Uh, so it's different from 21st century skills, right? Future-proof learning is something that creates uh, anchors in our students so that they can uh, new knowledge and they can be more flexible. So um, I have uh, in this slide you see the most um, 
the most the most um, important skills according to these um, um, 60 some experts from North America and Europe, educational experts. These are people with a lot of uh, research uh, background and publications. And so they think that the most important is metacognition and reflection. And then skill transfer, critical thinking, learning in authentic situations, competences, and so on. Um, I can share with you the link to the article. It's freely available online. Uh, but uh, I wanted to focus on these specific skills now. And um, let's see how fast this one will react to the next slide. Um, okay, is this the right one? Okay, so. So one of the uh, the the best ways to um, stimulate the acquisition of these kind of skills uh, is to immerse students in authentic or real world tasks. Uh, and real world tasks support critical thinking, acquisition of professional skills, situated knowledge. Uh, also, the, depending on how you design these uh, real world tasks, uh, can promote uh, collaboration and higher order, order thinking. Um, so in some universities, maybe you have uh, specific requirements for teacher to make uh, their um, classes more student-centered. And I'll talk a little bit about what is student-centered versus um, teacher-centered. Uh, but uh, also we have a lot of uh, faculty who are more like the sage on stage and they lecture more and then students uh, knowledge is tested through quizzes through final exams or eventually papers um, but and i try to think of some examples that could relate to uh, the the courses um, you might be teaching in a business uh, that would be for example um, uh, stimu simulate negotiation or simulate job interview uh, so I'll give you an example from my own practice. I teach digital literacy and one of my topics is called digital um, identity. So I uh, ask students to uh, analyze their online presence through their Facebook, through uh, their Instagram or whatever other social network accounts they might have, as well just search for themselves in um, uh, through the search engines and um, and I ask them to put themselves in a, in, a, in a situation where if you are an employer and you receive an autobiography or and a motivation letter from a student who applies for internship, what kind of things are you going to look into to decide whether you want this person or not? Uh, and what should this person be able to tell you? What skills do they have? And so on. So uh, this is one way for me to put students in a more realistic situation where they can also critically analyze their own presence online. And it's usually easier to be critical to other people than to oneself. So I give them this opportunity to look critically into other people's um, online presence and self-presentation and self-image building and, they, and then their own. Uh, inviting practitioners as guest lecturers is also, uh, um, maybe you're doing this, I know that not all of our uh, courses are doing this, but guest lecturers actually um, are, are interesting because they can present uh, to students authentic uh, situations with which they are engaged. I'm sorry. I am live. Sorry. Um, so, um, but it's also the guest lecturers, they, they, have, they, they have a lot of knowledge, they can share a lot of situations, but in, in one way to make this more interesting for students is also to uh, work with the guest lecturer ahead of time if possible and ask them to make the QA sessions with the students and give them some sort of challenges. Uh, for example, give a worked out example, this is what we did in such and such situation and then propose um, uh, a similar situation, but not give all of the hints uh, know all of the situation so that know all of the description of the situation so that students can fill fit, fit in 
uh, and come up with their own uh, solution to the uh, uh, to the uh, situation and also uh, use examples from students everyday life of how can they um, change or solve a problem uh, that they see every day for example um, uh, how they redesign a, uh, a, a, a space or how they redesign a, a section in a in a shop or how would they um, um, what kind of people for example um, what kind of skills should they look into a person if they were to appoint um, a, like a management uh, the management position so these authentic or real world tasks they can be ill-defined that is you you don't have to uh, give all of the uh, uh, the parameters of a situation, but uh, you want them to be um, solvable and not too big. Now, if you, when your students acquire enough of, uh, of, of competences related to their job, and when they work out through uh, more of uh, real world tasks, then we can move to um, something more complex which would be uh, cases. Um, how many of you use cases in your teaching? Okay, uh, Jim, thank you very much for your comment. So Jim is um, saying that um, with the rapid development of game technologies, um, with the ability to play with others across the globe, need to be harnessed to engage students, executives in simulated learning experiences, yes, rather than in only war games. So um, I wanna make a, a, a point on the difference between vicarious learning and learning in a simulation, because simulation can be vicarious learning in a way, but um, this is when you give workout examples to when you when you ask when you want students to acquire um, skills, uh, and this is I'm going to give you again an example. Of my, it's a simple. Um, it's simple. Um, no, we can go to the next slide. Uh, it's a simple case, but may, I think you will understand. So um, one of the things that I teach my students is information literacy and how do they uh, search for academic literature in uh, databases. So the first thing I do is that I give them a worked out example. If this is your question and these are the search terms you used and this is the uh, results you came up with, can you look through these results and tell me are they relevant? And so we discuss this and then the next time I give them a list of results but I don't give them neither the search terms I have used nor the research questions I have had and so they have to work out and then in the end they have to gradually come up with uh, an understanding of if I want to have relevant results, these are the kind of um, tools that I have to use, and these are the kind of uh, keywords that I should um, use. So this is in, for the differentiation between um, uh, vicarious learning, where I just explain to them what uh, they should do, and immersive situations where they actually have to do it themselves, and this is scaffolding them, essentially. Uh, so cases are essential, yes, I, uh, I, I agree with you. So. Um, the case uh, for those who might not be using cases and I want to advocate the, uh, the, the case for case studies uh, is that as a teaching method, they lead students to apply critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, learning authentic situations, and also the uh, cases support skill transfer. And skill transfer is very important. If you remember in the slide that I showed you what are the top five or six uh, skills that we need to make sure our students have one is transferability of skills. So case, studies, case studies uh, allow this to happen. And I have um, two, just two examples. There are plenty of examples out there on the internet about case studies from different business schools. I just took the two major ones. Uh, but I uh, would like to emphasize on something. Uh, while you can use in your teaching practice case studies from um, that other people or colleagues have developed this would be one way this is the worked out example that you want to go uh, through with your students but um, it is even more so relevant if you create your own cases or you look for cases within the environment in the city where students live uh, or 
with uh, in partnership with um, companies that you work with um, and um, maybe this is happening elsewhere as well here at AUCA our uh, business students they now have a choice between writing a, a senior thesis which is more purely strictly academic or they can uh, do cases and that is they are placed in a company and the company actually approaches the university with a specific problem they have and our students actually help the company solve that. Um, sometimes they are they come and say, well, we, um, the, 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 the um, solution we proposed <laughs> might not be liked by some people, uh, but, uh, but it's but uh, appreciated by the administration. So they feel that their knowledge actually has a practical application. Uh, so my suggestion again to summarize is you can use elaborate case studies as a, uh, as a worked out examples but then also um, create your own and engage your students with, again, real world, um, that is in their immediate environment um, cases. And um, maybe it would be nice if Katie or Jim could share some uh, examples that would be, I think that would be useful for the audience. Could you, um, if you are still, if you still hear me, can share maybe one or two examples of cases that you use, situations that you put your students in. Well, um, why well, I'm hoping that Katie or Jim or somebody else is um, writing I, um, I would like to give you an example. This is uh, not from uh, the business administration department. It's from uh, the social sciences uh, on a, in a course on uh, urban development where students uh, have to work on, well, depending if the class size is bigger, maybe they choose two projects, but basically students are pick up a, a problematic uh, in a neighborhood uh, where something is missing and they are uh, apply all of the skills that they have acquired all the knowledge they have acquired throughout the course to design or redesign the space so um, the way this is done is that um, the students work with the authorities and this way they know that the proposal they come up with has been um, negotiated already uh, and maybe even uh, given permission uh, uh, for a, um, accomplishment by the relevant authorities, by the city hall or some owned uh, local communities. And also they have to discuss with, uh, with the community, with the people from the neighborhood uh, in order to provide the best uh, design uh, that suits everyone. So, um, so this is a great experience for them because they leave the course uh, and it's, a, it's not even a required course, it's an elective course with a hands-on activity with real world knowledge and, um, and it's a very effective uh, way. So Jim is saying that he work, we work in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America or Asia to train health sector managers and board members. The cases must be relevant to the local context. Yes, the culture, language and sector challenges and opportunities Thank you for emphasizing on this, Jimmy. Yes, definitely the local context and culture are very important. Um, and, uh, and that's why I also want to investigate how our uh, employers here in our part of the world in Central Asia uh, think about uh, skills uh, because it's important to see what the different st stakeholders, how the different stakeholders see a situation. Um, Okay, and Katie is sharing a course on capital budgeting based on decision made by university regarding student housing replacement. Okay, um, this is a. Uh, I don't know if you. Sorry, I'm so new to the to your network, but I wonder if you have a um, beyond the uh, the webinars. Whether you have any space or platform where you can share your experiences and ideas. Um, the, uh, the university where I work is, uh, is a part of a network of American universities, liberal arts universities from outside of the US, and we 
have an, a, a consortium and we actually have this special interest groups where we work together. For example, we have a group of uh, people who work on uh, implementing digital literacies. Uh, we have a group of people who have centers for faculty development. Um, and um, unless you already have something like this, I would strongly encourage you. You have uh, so much experience from different contexts and it's, it would be great if you could share um, more of like these cases that Jim and, and Katie are are sharing now. Thank you so much for this. Um, okay, I uh, think um, I would like to move to the next slide. So, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, the uh, the educational experts uh, that have been interviewed for the um, future proof learning um, uh, uh, think that the most important skill we need to um, teach our, our students this is metacognition and um, which is critical awareness of one own knowledge. Um, and metacognitive practices allow students to um, skill, for skill transferability, to know their strengths and their weaknesses, and also to be able to create plans of individual uh, or self-development. Now, I want to um, mention here, um, a major postulate in educational uh, sciences uh, and uh, this is this has been said m many years ago half a century ago maybe even more in the 50s by david ozubel uh, who says that the most important single factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows uh, now i come from the social sciences and in the social sciences there are oftentimes a lot of misconceptions. Students come with uh, pre-made ideas or folk knowledge that they acquire from exchange in their families, people, the, the media. And oftentimes this knowledge is incomplete. It might be completely wrong as well. This seemed to be particularly true for psychology. Um, so getting to know where your students stand in terms of their existing knowledge is important. And I think that uh, I'm an advocate of always um, test your exist students' existing knowledge. Uh, even though, for example, you know, I had this conversation with a colleague who was teaching uh, history of um, economics. He was in an economics department. And we had like, yeah, but students won't know about uh, Adam Smith or um, they wouldn't know that these uh, theorists. And I was like, no, but they could probably understand some real life uh, situations and then you will tell them how this can be explained with such and such theory but you do want to know what is that they, they know so far um, and so asking students priming students with questions like what do you already know about the topic is actually a metacognitive uh, practice is engaging them in a, in a metacognitive practice and um, and also during your class time or throughout the semester you can ask students to think of what confuses them about either the activities they do in class or the materials that uh, they, uh, uh, they go through. But it's important that the question is not only you asking students, what is it that you don't understand? Because all of us who are in the classroom, we do know that some students might respond, some students might not, but you want to uh, have students ask these questions by themselves. And how do you do this? Maybe you can uh, ask them to write reflection, reflection journals. Um, or also come up with questions about the material and make this as a graded um, assignment. Um, in the flipped uh, classroom approach, we usually hope that students will do the readings and then they will come with questions. But uh, oftentimes we know that they don't do this. So one way to do, um, to solve this is might be give points or some sort of rewards for when students come generate their own questions and the ability to generate uh, one's own question, this is already higher order um, learning. And uh, eventually in retrospective, ask students to uh, think what is it that they knew before and that what is it that they know now after they have taken our class. Um, and um, I do this with um, when I teach information literacy and critical evaluation of online information, actually I ask students to a question 
Um, this kind of happened um, a little bit. I didn't anticipate this kind of answers, but I guess the way I formulated my question, I wanted to ask students, what did you learn from this specific uh, example? Uh, and then the way they, I, I guess the way I formulated the question was a little bit more general and then students came up with this, all of them. Oh, at the beginning, I just never really considered that information I find on, online might be false. And I didn't even think that people would necessarily make uh, misleading cases. But now we went through this exercise and I understand the limitations of my own knowledge. And now I have the tools to, um, to work better. So this can be adapted to all uh, sort of situations where you can use it as a part of one assignment or as part of the course. And um, if any of you is uh, involved in uh, course evaluation, I think this is probably a more meaningful course evaluation uh, for, for the educator when they know what is the student, what did the student think about their own learning. And then maybe we'll realize that we are grading them on things that uh, they don't necessarily acquire, but they might have acquired other skills. And this, this you can use this as a self-reflection for yourself, your own metacognitive practices of, um, uh, improving your class or changing some things in your class. And um, so I'm trying to go to the next slide and wrap up already. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, we had this question earlier in the presentation is what can we do? So these are authentic uh, case, uh, authentic learning, uh, real life problems, uh, case studies, which are a little bit more elaborate, well, or maybe much more elaborate. Um, and um, metacognitive practices. Of course, there are many more things that we can think of, but um, we, are, we don't have that much time. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to you in any other moment or exchange through email or another digital format. But uh, I wanted to finish with um, what can we as educators do about our, uh, about our ability to uh, put students in design um, such situations. So I wanted to, um, to mention uh, Diana Loria, she is um, from the Open University uh, in the UK, and she has um, her she has books. One of the books I strongly recommend you, and I'll write the name um, here. It's um, Teaching as a Design a Science. Uh, so in this book, she says something that I really like. Uh, she says teaching is not rocket science; it is much harder than that because rocket science uh, moves an object from A to B, teaching moves a mind from A to B. So, um, okay. Okay, Jim, I'll, I'll come back to your question in a, in a second. Um, so the role, I think that uh, maybe um, we here could agree on that, but I know that um, this is a difficult thing to, um, to bring to every single educator is uh, that the educator is not the sole beholder of knowledge uh, or the sage on stage as we have this expression, but more we should consider our roles as that of the designers of context and activities which promote learning. And I'm gonna drop here another nice term, which is mathemogenic activities. Um, and this, was also, this is also an old term, it's from the middle of the 20th century um, by Rob Kopp. Um, so, to design real life, to, to put students in real life situations, you have to find out these situations. You have to design the context. Um, the, you have to design the, the, the specific activities they are going to do. Uh, and you need to think of if student, if I give this to students, what are the possible learning outcomes? Uh, and what do I really want students to take out of this? And this is a self-reflection, uh, as I said, a moment for ourselves. Also, um, I think that students should be aware not only of what they have learned, as I gave this example, before I didn't even consider that information online might be wrong or uh, incomplete, uh, and now, now I know that. So this is what they have learned, but it's important of how did they learn that. And we as teachers, as designers, we have to design these um, uh, activities that um, bring them to learn but also we need we should ask students to reflect on um on how did they get to this so 
so that they observe their own process. And this is important for metacognition. And how is this relevant to jobs in, in 20 years from now? It's when people know their own limitations that they know that it's one thing to know that you, are, you learn better in the evening, your night all, and this is when you're more productive for whatever reasons. But this is not exactly how do you learn. I know for myself, I learn, I learn a lot when I, um, there is this, uh, I don't remember who said that, um, uh, and I, I take this as a personal challenge. If I want to learn something, I challenge my, myself to teach it because then I am a learner and a teacher at the same time. And this is actually putting me as a teacher in a very authentic situation where I, I am really in the shoes of the, of the students. Uh, okay, so a few other things. Uh, because I mentioned in the beginning that uh, our role as educators not only is changing, but uh, maybe it might, it, some people might think it, it will become obsolete because there is already so much information people can produce. I even read somewhere about a, um, a, a school that only has online uh, materials and no teachers whatsoever. The teachers were there to design the materials and, and the exercises and, and that's it. And uh, I, I teach in a liberal arts school, so, um, but I'm also, my background is educational technology. So I think it's an interesting topic to debate on. Uh, but in either case, um, consider giving badges to students for accomplishments uh, that go beyond the grade or beyond a stamp that we put for um, completing the course. And also consider that um, we, we might have clear learning outcomes for our courses, but how the students are going to get to these learning outcomes, they, can, they might have a, multiple, um, a variety of learning pathways. And uh, when I mention digital literacies and teacher professionalization, I, I do keep in mind that through, through technology, we can actually allow for these uh, multiple uh, learning pathways. Also, I have this advice to you if you don't use it already, and we started trying to implement this in our university, support students' portfolios. Uh, this is a, a metacognitive practice to write in their portfolios. B, it's also um, kind of a selling point where students can um, showcase their best uh, accomplishments, a, a best product. Um, and how can they showcase if we make them write uh, papers, um, publish them, researchgate, academia.edu, or make them produce videos um, or some digital artifacts that demonstrate their, their ability. For example, um, if you teach a class on um, marketing, um, have as an assignment for students to do a commercial. And then this commercial, it's a video, they can upload it onto their uh, portfolios. Um, so arguably our students now use more technology in general, I'm talking in general, we use more technology uh, than we do. And they will definitely use more technology um, after graduation when they are in the workplace. So, um, I have students coming to me and telling me, oh, in our uh, internship uh, company, uh, they ask us to use Excel and uh, we don't know how to, but we are not offered classes. And I tell them, it's not Excel that you need to know. It's math and it's logic and it's whatever other accounting um, functions that it's, it's, the, it's the thinking that you need to know. It's this knowledge that you need and then Excel or something else, it's just the tool that allows you. Um, we have uh, students in social sciences freaking out, oh, SPSS is so difficult. And I was like, you just didn't get statistics very well. SPSS is really easy to use once you know what you can do, um, what you need to do. And then the tool is just there to serve you. Um, so, um, which also means that uh, we can, we should be aware of what technology is out there and keep ourselves up to date. But um, it doesn't mean that we need to master all of this technology. We need to know mainly what the students need to be. They need to have the concepts and how to navigate in an environment. So for example, my students produce a, a video projects at the end of the semester. I don't teach them how to do videos. I guide them through when they show me their drafts. But what I really care about is what is it that they say and how do they deliver it and do they use the methods that I have told them. Um, I, and also they are not journalism students, so I don't expect them to do uh, great things. 
but they actually figure it out very, very fast because they know what is that they need to produce. And then the tool doesn't really matter so much. I mean, um, this is contrary to Mark Luhan's, um media is the message, but I think that uh, we don't need our students to um, uh, be that uh, proficient in one or another tool. They need to be proficient in learning how to use different tools. And, um, and this is also medical cognitive practices. And uh, finally, um, shifting from teacher-centered to student-centered approach, this requires training. So I don't know if in your institutions you have a center for teacher, teacher and professional development, uh, but I think that um, I, I, in, uh, in our university, this has been five years and the center is still small. I would love to employ more people. Uh, and I know partner universities which don't have Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, which is um, which is is a issue that should be addressed because um, keeping yourself up to date with your subject is great, but teaching is an actual profession. And um, I don't know, maybe could you tell us whether in your institutions for new teachers, you have trainings on how to teach. Um, we're actually going to have this mandatory for all of our new teachers, um, but um, this is only happening now and in some institutions, they don't even think of that, which is, um, especially for smaller institutions is, um, or even for big, doesn't really matter whether you're in front of uh, 10 people or 100 people, um, you need to know how to approach the, the audience and how do you design activities for a large group or for a small group. Um, but um, because I do these course design training with our new faculty, I see that um, switching from a, me as the beholder of knowledge, delivering it to students to what is important for students to be able to do and how do I design the context around that and not necessarily deliver content. This is actually challenging for some people, especially I think people who have been predominantly um, in, uh, invested in research. Uh, so it's a, it's a training that is required. Uh, I'm done talking and I'm gonna read uh, Jim's uh, comment here, which is if I can share after the session, I'm very happy to share everything I have I will, and I'll take note of your email for handbooks and guides in the health sector. They can be accessed here. Okay, um, thank you very much, all public domain. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I think this is my last slide, so I am going to let the floor to you um, for questions. Mm. Okay. Oh, this is great, Katie. This is uh, this is amazing. You have academic professional development classes, a faculty mentor, which is which is wonderful, uh, and first year uh, for new faculty. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have this peer evaluation as part of the uh, um, evaluation process, but I think that the faculty mentor is a way better uh, approach. Uh, because it's not something that people are afraid of. Um, and uh, we, I, I have a, we have a, a first year seminar, um, first year experience, uh, what, whichever way you might call this, um, where teachers basically have a standard uh, curriculum to teach and some of the colleagues switch classes so that they can see how their students are. Uh, and it's actually has been very insightful. Um, do you have any uh, questions for me or some things that you would like to discuss? I think we are past uh, the time. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I'll make sure to, um, to uh, take your contact. Um, okay, well, um, I actually wanted to, to, uh, to finish with this, that uh, you are, you as teachers, um, you are doing more than rocket science. So I congratulate you for that. And I'm very happy to exchange on um, further. You have been very, uh, very uh, interesting um, small group. I really appreciate for your inputs and uh, have a wonderful evening or day or whatever part of the, the day it is for you. I just want to note too that um, the PowerPoint 
and all the messages um, and email exchanges will be posted on the GBS on website. I will share everyone's email with Professor Popova um, so you guys can follow up with her later. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I see everyone that, that logged in was from the US, so it's very <laughs> late for us. Um, and we'll, we'll share all the materials with those who weren't able to log in as well. Thank you.